from uh, Dr. Satya Naikar uh, in Coimbatore and she's going to talk us or take us through on the highs and lows of IOP post uh, glaucoma surgery. Uh, over to you, uh, Shweta. For the next few minutes, do enlighten us. Thank you, Dr. Prasanna. So my talk will be on lows and highs of IOP. So you know, as you know, trabeculectomy surgery, uh, doing a trabeculectomy surgery is only 50% of the job done. Mm -hmm. The main thing is the post-operative care that sh we should have. So uh, what do you see when a patient is coming back to you uh, after trabeculectomy? One, you see the IOP. Second, you see the bleb characteristics. Then the anterior chamber depth, any re uh, reactions in the anterior chamber, and finally the fundus examination. So in the post-operative period, you can have a low IOP or a high IOP with shallow or a deep AC. So when you have a low IOP with a shallow AC, you have to look at the bleb, how the bleb characteristic is, whether it is flat or it is diffuse or elevated. If the bleb is flat, you have to look for a bleb leak. Uh, and if it is diffuse, uh, large diffuse or elevated, look for an overfiltration. So then we have a seroscoroidal detachment, which is actually a complication of a Higher over hypotony rather than directly a trabeculectomy. Now let us look at the early bleb leak. So when you have an early bleb leak, just know your leaks. See the surgeon will all uh, will know why exactly they are having a leak. It can be because of a perforation or any uh, button holding, some suture tracks or inadequate closure. So you would have uh, just do a gentle handling of the conjunctiva when you do perform the surgery. So uh, identify the signs of the leak. You have to do a serial test for identifying the signs of leak. So you can see that uh, after staining with the fluorescent, you can see the leak. Uh, bleb leak can happen even in the late post-operative period. It can happen even after five years, especially when you use anti-metabolites like mitomycin C. You can see that you can get these uh, thin cystic blebs. So uh, if you see this, you see that uh, little um, deposits, black deposits you see on the bleb. This is an indication that that area will be thinned out and it will be leaking. So this uh, serial test show that uh, there is a leakage. And uh, if you see the bleb, bleb will be thin cystic and uh, that will have a small uh, deposit there. Now, for management of bleb leak, first thing is pursue conservative management. If you have a very minimal leak, just do a pressure patch or a large bandage contact lens, decrease the steroids. Gentamicin and tobramycin eye drops also help in increasing the fibrosis and it will uh, increase inflammation and cause healing. Or you can use a fibrin glue. So if this is not working or if the um, leak is little more and the tear is little more, you have to do a direct suturing or a revision of the conjunctival advancement. We have to monitor the patient closely because this will reduce the risk of infection. Now coming on to the excessive filtration, you have excessive filtration when you uh, the bleb is formed and there is no leak from that, but you have a large diffuse bleb. So especially when you create a flap, if you make a thin flap, once it, uh, uh, once it is healing, that flap will get contracted and the le it can leak from the sides. Uh, if you have a disproportionately large ostium size, and a more posterior ostium, this can also cause increase in filtration. Then we have a loose scleral flap closure. If you close it loosely, and if the patient squeezes the size, it is going, the suture is going to give away, and that will cause a uh, overfiltration. So if you have an overfiltration, even if you give a minimal pressure, you can see that the bleb is getting formed. So for overfiltration, initially do the conservative, taper the steroids, pressure patch, and large diameter contact lens. If this doesn't work, you find out what the cause is. If it is a thin flap, uh, you may have to go uh, do a revision and keep a patch graft. Or you can do, um, um, how do you say, if the suture is given away, you will have to go and resuture the flap. Now, is autologous blood injection helpful? It is helpful initially, like if you have to take direct blood, in, uh, blood from the cubital vein and then inject directly into the blood. But the problem with this is it increases the fibrosis, it increases the healing. So it will work for some time, but later on it's invariably the bleb is going to fail because it is going to increase the fibrosis and cause more scarring. Uh, ultimately, if nothing works, you will have to go for the scleral flap suturing with or without graft, but make sure that when you uh, keep a graft, just don't tighten it uh, tightly. Just You can just uh, suture it on the limbal area. 
So the best way is to prevent it by tight closure. You can use uh, releasable suture or uh, tight suture, nylon sutures, and then later on do a laser suture lysis. Now coming to a serous choroidal detachment, which is a complication of a hypotony. You may not see a serous choroidal detachment in a fundus photo, but if you see the mosaic photo, you can beautifully see the choroidal detachment. So CD can come along with an hypotony maculopathy also like this. So when will you intervene surgically? CD is basically, it is a cause of a leak. So you have to identify what is the problem, whether it's a bleb leak or it's a flap uh, ink, uh, overfiltration. Correct it first, the CD will come down. Or if it is because of an inflammation, if you taper, uh, increase the steroids and put them on three days uh, IV steroids, it comes down. But if you have a kissing choroidals or the flat AC with compromised cornea or chronic CD with hypotony maculopathy, you will go have to go ahead and do a CD drainage. But when you do a CD drainage, initially you do a parasynthesis, form the AC and see whether there is any leak. If suppose there is any leak, you will have to suture it because that is the most common thing that we'll have. Uh, uh, and then when you're doing the CD drainage, do it step by step, very slowly, each layer by layer. And then you see the choroid, uh, you just open it up. You can see the little yellow liquid that is coming out. You have to do this uh, in the inferior part. Now coming to the hypotony maculopathy, uh, we, we expect a hypotony maculopathy in a young myopic patient and if uh, you're using more adjunctive. Uh, so hypotony maculopathy patient can come with uh, market decrease in vision and you can see the fundus photo and if you take an OCT you can see lots of uh, uh, wrinkling in the choroid and retina. But the same thing as I said, uh, once you see what the cause is, treat it. If it is a leak, just treat it and then this will, uh, this will uh, be resolved. Now coming to the high AOP and shallow AC, you can have either my aqueous misdirection, delayed suprachoroidal hemorrhage, incomplete iridectomy with a pupillary block. So aqueous misdirection syndrome, uh, there will be an axial shallowing in an anterior chamber. It will be totally flat and you will have a patent iridectomy. And there won't be any, uh, you have to rule out other choroidal fluids and other leaks and B scan uh, uh, will not show any choroidal fluid. So in aqueous misdirection, the first treatment uh, is once you see a shallow AC, you have to put a mediatic cycloplegic. Anyway, the patient will be on a cycloplegic post trabeculectomy. So you have to just increase the dose. And uh, next method is to do an iridotomy, capsulotomy, hyaldotomy. You, you will have a PA. Through the PA, you can use a YAG laser and uh, do an iridotomy, capsulotomy, and hyaldotomy. You can do it surgically too. And if nothing works, you will have to go ahead and do the vitrectomy. Uh, it's because the aqueous is draining into the vitreous. It is causing the vitreous pocket. So you will have to uh, make that anterior hyaloid uh, uh, so that anterior and posterior chamber is getting, um, what do you say, the aqueous is able to escape into the anterior part. Now coming to the suprachoroidal hemorrhage, um, the risk factor is aphakia and previous vitrectomy. The patient will complain of severe pain and nausea and there will be marked reduction in the vision. So we'll have uh, dark uh, red um, dome-shaped elevations and in B scan, uh, there will be hyperechoic spaces. So surgical intervention, if you want to drain the suprachoroidal hemorrhage, always wait for two weeks, at least two weeks, so that the clot get lysed but the visual outcome is poor, then you have the pupillary block, if only if the PA is getting uh, blocked. So you just do the laser. Uh, here the central AC will be deeper than the peripheral AC and uh, the iris bombay formation would be there. Now coming to high AOP and deep AC, here you have to identify the cause. So it'll be, it is because it's not draining, so it can be either high tight flap closure or an internal obstruction or a failing bleb. So uh, the most common thing what we get is the tight scleral sutures. You're tying it too tightly. So you the flap, uh, bleb will be flat. Now, does this bleb massage work? So when do you do a massage? Uh, immediate post-operative period, you have, you, it's better that you don't do a um, uh, massage so that sometimes the sutures may give away. You can wait for some time and if the IOP is little high and you know that it is a tight scleral uh, scleral closure after seven, 7 to 10 days you at the OPD in the slit lamp you can massage uh, but for uh, only after 4 weeks you are going to tell the patient to do the massage patients doing the massage is only for the 4 weeks 
So you can see that uh, this is a tight steel uh, uh, flap and you just give a firm compression. We usually do it in the superior area, just temporal to the bleb, just do a firm compression and the uh, bleb is formed well. Now the next option is to do a releasable suture. So releasable suture, uh, this is what we do. Uh, so there are three steps. First is the corneal um, bite that will be uh, parallel to the limbus. Then second, you have to put a perpendicular bite in the cornea. Then go and uh, to the flap uh, apex closure. Then you put four throws and then tighten it. So this is a releasable suture. So you can tighten it really tight so that in the post-operative period, you see if the IOP is getting high, you can just uh, remove it. So after closing this, you have to uh, cut both this end and the other end. So this is a releasable suture and then you have the laser suture lysis. Uh, you can use uh, argon laser 50 to 100 micrometer, 400 to 600 um, um, milliwatt and uh, 0.1 second. The problem with the laser suture lysis is you can have a hypotony and congenital per perforation. So you have to do remove one suture at a time, never remove all the sutures together. But once you have used an ologen here, uh, doing a laser suture lysis is difficult because you won't be seeing the sutures. So either put a releasable suture or what we do is we use, uh, instead of the nylon suture, we are using the uh, absorbable sutures. Now coming to the internal obstruction, you have to do uh, a gonioscopy to find out if anything is uh, obstructing the trabeclectomy ostium. Here you can see that the uh, iris is blocking the ostium. In such cases, if the IOP is high, you can use a uh, laser to uh, just uh, uh, to the peripheral area so that it will just move away from there. Or you have to go surgically and take a spatula and uh, just release that area. So uh, when you see the pupil, that area superiorly, it will have a peaking. That is how you will know that there is a uh, block. Now, early bleb failure, it is because of excessive wound healing. So this is a mitomycin bleb. It will have ex excessive hyperemia, vascularization, and the encapsulated bleb, or it will be flat and small encapsulated bleb. But this is, uh, this is an ologen bleb, both right and left side. This is a rectangular bleb, and that is, uh, that is a uh, circular ologen. So never mistake a round ologen for an encapsulated bleb. Ologen blebs will be little more vascularized than the mitomycin bleb. So seeing a uh, congested bleb in ologen is normal, whereas in uh, MMC, if you see something like this, it is a sign that it is going for failure. So is bleb needling um, useful? So um, when you see a failing bleb or you see an encapsulated bleb, you do the bleb needling and you can use a mitomycin. But the problem with this is that initial period it will work well, but uh, after five to six months, it is going to increase the fibrosis and ultimately the bleb is going to fail. So you may have to do a bleb revision. Now late filtration failure can become because of the closure of fistula, fibrosis of the scleral flap and scarring of the conjunctival portion of the bleb. So you may have to do the bleb revision, repeat trabeclectomy or go for the GDD. So how do you decide whether you go for a repeat trabeclectomy or a drainage device? Now one, uh, one thing is you have to see that time of failure since the primary surgery. If it is more than two years, you can try a repeat trabeclectomy. But if it has failed in less than two years, repeat trabeclectomy is not going to help you. And uh, then you will have to go with a glaucoma drainage device. So uh, this is, uh, so I conclude here. Uh, it is a large topic. Uh, to, uh, I've just given a brief idea of what it is. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Satin sir, my mentor, and Dr. Prasanna Venkatesh Ramesh, who has given me this opportunity to speak, and Dr. Arut Priya, who has helped me with the uh, videos and uh, photos. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shweta. And uh, you're hot from your uh, FAICO, which you did yesterday. Uh, she was just recently awarded the FICO award and a uh, big round of applause for her uh, for that also. Thank you, Shweta. Sh within short notice when we didn't have Tamonash, she agreed to uh, cover a very difficult, but uh, I hope uh, it really made sense for everyone who are here. We'll take questions now or we can take it at the end also. And yeah, next we'll have uh, 
uh, Dr. Saurabh, he's going to talk on how retina takes the brunt. So we glaucoma surgeons, we think more of optic nerve and to an extent we think about the macula as well as to uh, the ganglion cell layer, inner plexiform layers which recently we take it into account. But how does the retina take the brunt after a glaucoma surgery aftermath? Over to you uh, Dr. Kumar Saurabh. Please proceed. Thank you, Dr. Prasanna. Uh, so, I am Dr. Kumar Saro. I am a retina surgeon. I am not a glaucoma specialist. So, I will be talking about this, uh, what happens to the retina after an eventful glaucoma surgery or a usual complication of glaucoma surgery. So, um, these are my disclosures. So there are a few retinal complications which was also discussed a little in the previous uh, presentation. There are choroidal attachments, decompression retinopathy, bleb related endophthalmitis and hypotony maculopathy. Now this choroidal attachment is a very common complication of glaucoma surgery and mostly it, uh, it is uh, self-limiting with the correction of hypotony. However, it is noted that around 14% of patients will have serious choroidal attachment and hemorrhagic choroidal attachment happens in around 2 to 3% eyes. So this is not very uncommon. This is how a serious choroidal attachment looks like. Uh, there will be a large mound or a subtle mound on the peri in the periphery. And uh, we can note that on the ultrasonography that the peris choroid is elevated along with uh, hypoechoic or hyporeflective space between choroid and sclera. That means there's it's, a f it's filled with fluid, serous fluid. So it's not a hemorrhagic detachment. So when we have uh, serious choroidal attachment, it usually happens in the early post-operative period, sometimes immediately after uh, glaucoma filtration surgery. And most of the these patients are usually asymptomatic apart from hypotony because it happens early. And uh, since the detachment is located in the periphery, the macula usually remains fine in the early stage, so the vision remains fine. It is usually associated with overdrainage and hypotony. So what do we do? for serious choroidal attachment. It usually responds and uh, resolves spontaneously with the correction of hypotony. Usually sometimes oral steroid is given when the hypotony is taking longer to resolve or even after resolution of hypotony the serious detachment is still persisting. Surgical drainage as shown in the last uh, video, uh, last presentation is done sometimes and it's a, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a simple procedure where it can be drained externally. Whereas hemorrhagic choroidal attachment is a sudden painful uh, event which happens after uh, glaucoma surgery and it usually is uh, very debilitating for the vision. So there is, a, there is a vision drop in this uh, complication. Most of the time there is high IOP and shallow entry chamber because of the uh, increase in the amount of the intraocular content. Oral steroid is, is to be started uh, without any weight in this uh, hemorrhagic choroidal attachment. And most of the time surgical evacuation is likely and uh, sometimes past prana vitrectomy is also needed because, because the kissing choroids usually stick together and uh, ex simple external drainage in hemorrhagic choroidal attachment may not work. Next is a decompression retinopathy. This, this is a picture of a 26 years old boy, man who had undergone uh, trabeculectomy with uh, Dr. Kamunash and I was seeing this patient. So, this happens because of the sudden lowering of the um, uh, sudden lowering of the eye intraocular pressure from a very high level to very normal or below no uh, low normal levels. These are multi-layered hemorrhages throughout the fundus, which can happen in the sub ilum or sub uh, superficial layers, in even in the subretinal spaces. Within first few days of the surgery, it happens, and uh, patients, um, if the hemorrhage is located at the fovea, then patient may have a vision drop, like in this patient, like in this case. If the patient doesn't have any comorbidities and there is no predisposing factor, then we may not do any fluorescent angiography and just observation will help. But sometimes if the patient has comorbidities, then we cannot just simply say that it is a decompression retinopathy because it can also be uh, CRVO. So sometimes fluorescent angiography is needed in a patient who is predisposed to develop CRVO, otherwise it is not needed and it usually clears with observation. So these are the few complications and the most dreaded one is a bleb related endophthalmitis. Again, it is around noted in around 10% uh, of glaucoma surgery eyes. It can be acute and chronic. Acute is uh, within six weeks and chronic is within more than beyond six weeks. And mostly it is because of the periocular flora. Step hyalococci and streptococci are the most common causes. Blebitis without, blebitis is a different thing. It is 
without vitreous involvement and laboratory endothelial mitis is uh, with vitreous involvement but in clinical practice most of the blebitis will ultimately go into uh, endothelial mitis so from a vitreotina perspective whenever we, we find or whenever we are uh, asked to see a blebitis we mostly know or we mostly treat it as an endothelial mitis sometimes even the vitreous is clear then intravitreal injections might be given intravitreal antibiotics might be given because it's highly high likelihood of development of endothelial mitis and uh, this blebitis endothelial mitis usually have a very early scleral involvement so that's that's uh, reduces the pr prognosis of this 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 endothelial mitis and it is very uh, worse it has a worse uh, endo uh, prognosis than a post cataract endothelial mitis and anyway prompt treatment in intravitreal antibiotics and sometimes most of the times vitrectomy is needed and the last retinal complication is uh, hypotonic maculopathy it is usually seen in around uh, one fifth of the eyes undergoing glaucoma surgery and usually develops few days after surgery sometimes retina is thrown into folds and we can see uh, folds at the macula sometimes even the sclera is thrown into folds which can be noted on ultrasonography it doesn't mean that if the sclera is thrown into folds then the prognosis is bad scleral enfolding is is is, is has is having say usually has the same type time kind of uh, prognosis as the retinal enfolding optic disc edema happens in a long standing hypotonus maculopathy and if the uh, optic disc edema lasts for months then there can be a visual uh, permanent visual disability and may vision may not improve to the normal uh, level what what it could have uh, without hypotonus maculopathy but without optic disc edema in a hypotonus maculopathy of few weeks it usually resolves and uh, with a correction of hypotomy and uh, the vision is imp vision does improve to the normal levels so these are the few complications of uh, retinal complications of glaucoma surgery and uh, most of them usually are centered around hypotony and uh, and uh, bleeding ap apart from endophthalmitis which requires uh, early and prompt treatment thank you very much Thank you, sir, for this wonderful uh, talk and lecture. Anybody has any questions or shall we move to the next one? Right. We'll have questions at the end. We'll move to the next one. Right. So uh, the lens as a role is uh, what I'm going to take you through to the next uh, few minutes. Can I have a pointer, uh, AV team? Uh, so lens as a role, uh, sir, uh, AV, AV team, can I have, uh, Aditi, can you just give me a pointer? Yeah. So the lens as a role is what we are going to see in the next few minutes. So this is my first slide. You can see before cataract surgery and after cataract surgery. What do we observe in these two pictures? The thickness of the lens that you can see on your left hand side and you can see that this is almost 5 millimeters of thickness and on the right hand side after the lens has been extracted you can see how the 1 millimeter lens has caused a change in the anterior chamber. So this is something that we will be seeing in great detail and how this has made an impact in uh, glaucoma management. So, removing the lens, is it part of the solution is what it is being questioned nowadays. And let's see how, as I was pointing out, the thickness of the lens before surgery and the IOL after surgery. So, this is one of my patients where you can see the lens thickness before surgery is 4.74. I have not hid, uh, hidden the name of the patient. The consent has been obtained. I wanted you to see that after the surgery has been done, look at the anterior chamber depth. The now you can see it is from 2.73 the chamber has increased to 5.56. So now coming to angle closure. Angle closure is actually defined as the occlusion of the trabecular meshwork 
by the peripheral iris which is not been able to visualize at least equal to or greater than 180 degree that is a pigmented trabecular meshwork will not be visible for 180 degree or more and we have many categories PACS, PAC and PACG. I am not going, going to go into that but we are going to see how the lens has a role. So just taking you back to the pigmented trabecular meshwork which is what we need to keep a track on and uh, this is a normal gonioscopic video. So I am just orienting the neophytes who are here to just uh, one use, when you do the gonioscopy just make sure you identify the pigmented trabecular meshwork and grade your patient accordingly. Because angle closure disease only is something that is more common and the lens has a role to play in the angle closure disease. Most commonly if you see angle closure disease prevalence is 0.1 to 2 percent and if you don't treat a primary angle closure suspect they will progress to a primary angle closure in 5 years 4 out of 100 people will progress if you don't treat and then a primary angle closure will progress to a primary angle closure glaucoma 30 out of 100 if you don't treat. If you don't treat 100 patients 30 people will actually progress. So this is called the pinch region. So you can see the lens here. So the lens is having a pinch region. What is a pinch region is see basically physiological the posterior chamber will always have a high pressure compared to the anterior chamber. That is what gets the aqueous through the pupillary area into the anterior segment. There is a pressure drop of 0.23 millimeters of mercury between the posterior chamber and the anterior chamber in the anterior segment of the eye. So this is what is the pinch region or the iris lens channel. So you can see when the pupil is 3 to 7 millimeters in size it doesn't have any effect on the IOP but when meiosis happens the channel length is increased meaning the length of the channel is getting increased or the channel height, height meaning this is the height, the length is this way, the height is this way so the height gets reduced. So when the length increases or when the height decreases the posterior iris comes in contact with the anterior lens and then the pressure starts to rise even more in the posterior chamber and the iris becomes convex. So this is again another example of the pinch region in a hypermetropic eye shown on the left and uh, sorry hypermetropic is shown on the right and the myopic eye shown on the left. You can see the pinch region is more in the shallow chambered hypermetropic eye. The black box is more whereas you can see again in the myopic eye the pinch region's length is actually very minimal. So and as well as see the position of the lens, the lens seems to be more anterior in a hypermetropic eye. So these are all things that can actually cause a pupillary block to take place which in turn actually brings you the angle closure mechanism. That's how the pupillary block which happens here causes the angle closure. So that is why it is important my dear friends that we do the arc PA. So does lens have a role? Yes, it does have a role. So slowly we are moving towards the concept where lens have a role. So this is a YAG PA that we just saw an animation of a pupillary block. The Van Erix is grade 1 and uh, we, I'm just demonstrating it. And then we do a YAG PA by focusing on a crypt. So what do we expect by doing that is we just want to make sure that the pupillary block mechanism doesn't happen. See, that's the idea of going ahead and doing a YAG PA. So by doing a YAG PA, I will just take you through. So this is again another introductory video as to how we are doing an YAG PA for the benefit of the young audience. So I am just showing you this is without a Abraham lens. The last video was with the Abraham lens. So this is a photo disruption phenomenon. This is one of my own videos that we have taken and you can see uh, the YAG PA being done. Yes, coming back to our lens has a role. So before laser peripheral iridotomy and after laser peripheral iridotomy. So what are you observing here? If you see you can see in this region that is the angle that is very near to the cornea, the cornea and the iris here. Can you see it is marginally opening up? Yes. So that is what is our idea and you can see the anterior chamber. This picture was taken immediately after the YAG PA. So there is a lot of pigment dispersion in the anterior chamber and there is also a peripheral opening of the angle. So this is uh, the right eye and this is the left eye. In the left eye you can see again here the PA is done and you can see the PA here and the reflections behind and the angle is also seem to be open up. But again 
the lens is still there so that is why the chamber is not yet fully deepening so coming to the anatomy of angle closure we have two types of angle closure one is the opposition and another one is the synecal so that is what is the main reason so the left hand side if you see in your practice it is iris process and on the right hand side is what is a synecal synecal or it could be an oppositional angle closure so now you have to put your gonio and you'll have to see whether it's a uh, peripheral anterior synecal or is it a just a opposition so this is how you demonstrate the gonio as the so for example you are looking in the inferior mirror the inferior mirror the angle seems to be crowded ask the patient to look towards that mirror and now the angle seems to open so now we have differentiated whether it's a oppositional or a synecal angle closure so all these has a role in treating up angle closure patient so if it is going to be a uh, oppositional angle closure there is always a chance of going ahead and doing an argon laser peripheral iridoplasty so this is a normal angle these animations are one of mine and you can see this oppositional angle closure the peripheral area the laser is delivered and now once the laser comes and gets delivered it just opens up so this is a alpa argon laser peripheral iridoplasty this is again the same video i am just showing from the front on view all the 24 spots in 360 degrees and the same video in gonioscopic view where when you place a spot on a oppositional angle closure the angle opens up but this doesn't happen in a peripheral anterior synecal so these are simple concepts that we need to know when we move towards the lens because there is a certain way that we can open the angle by making a pa or an argon laser peripheral iridoplasty in the iris itself but then the main culprit would be the lens because the lens has a one uh, lens extraction pushes the whole chamber behind and opens up uh, the anterior chamber even more does cataract extraction have a role yes it lowers the iop it reduces the need of anti glaucoma medication it decreases the pressure proportional to the height of iop more the iop the cataract can after a cataract extraction the more chances of the iop getting reduced so how cataract extraction came as a therapy was though uh, through smaller incisions through minimal conjunctival manipulations because we as glaucoma persons we want the conjunctiva uh, because that is why we believe in doing the trabeculectomy there is minimal intraoperative fluctuations recently with the phaco dynamics there is not great iop fluctuations it is safer to perform even in advanced glaucoma cases nowadays so that brings us back to the original slide that i was starting does lens have a role so you can see it before surgery and after surgery how much the chamber deepens and this is the most important slide that removing the lens relieves the pupillary block rotates the iris posteriorly you can see the iris goes back posteriorly the zonules fall back posteriorly the ciliary body falls back posteriorly the scleral spur falls back posteriorly if there is a peripheral anterior synecal the anterior synecal uh, breaks and there is a increase in the anterior chamber space so you can see this after a surgery this is how the iris falls back this is animation showing how the ciliary body and the zonular vector forces fall back and in this you can see it's a zoomed view as to how the scleral spur will fall back the scleral spur falling back will actually make the trabecular meshwork pores to widen up and this is an animation showing how a peripheral anterior synecal can break after cataract surgery so there are so many things now as a glaucoma person we'll have three option what door should i walk in should i do a phaco alone or should i do a combined surgery or should i do a trab alone now these are the studies that i referred and this is the conclusion that i found if you have a primary angle closure disease and there is a cataract and there is a poorly controlled iop then you have two options you can go only with cataract extraction and later do a trab or you can go with a combined surgery i i prefer combined surgery and uh, but you need to keep in mind with combined surgery the complications were reported to be more and you also needed to have more interventions in the future like a bleb needling or a laser suture lysis and combined surgery is suggested for what you wanted to have a greater iop reduction the number of medications that the patient is putting can be brought down because patients with multiple allergies can be suggested this because they can't be putting the medication for a long time poor compliance if a patient seems to be poor compliant don't try to do only a phaco go with a phaco trabeculectomy and low tolerance to post operative complications such as moving on to the third door if you choose the third door that is phaco emulsification alone when do you say i'll go only for phaco the patient is a advanced glaucoma 
and there is low corneal endothelial cell count and these are modes when you can consider phaco only as the first line of option and then you choose the first door that is trabeculectomy alone that is not really indicated my dear friends like if you have a cataract and a primary angle closure disease it has a very mini minimal role because it doesn't really solve the cataract in the first place so this is a biometry following lensectomy you can see the anterior chamber widens the angle widens and the it widens in such a way that angle closure disease widens to such of a open angle disease these contributes again this is the main picture these are the things that contribute to a good reduction of iop a 5 mm fakey lens is replaced by a 1 mm uh, iol thickness so that is what really gives you the space inside the anterior chamber whereas in a plateau iris does the same thing happens no in plateau iris the same mechanism does not happen the iris does not fall back the ciliary body does not fall back because it's actually an anatomically anatomical disease only the anterior chamber will deepen but the ciliary body and iris approximation will be unchanged so you can see this is a plateau iris where there is a configuration here this never falls back in a lens extraction because this is another another mechanism of angle closure just like how we saw pupillary block was one of the mechanisms causing angle crowding plateau iris causes angle crowding without pupillary block we have to keep that in mind as well so this is more about moving to open angle we just saw about angle closure these are the studies i referred for open angle and what did they tell you when, when you extract the lens these things are less well studied in open angle but the iop can still reduce but the reduction is not as pronounced as in a primary angle closure disease and similarly like the combined phaco trabeculectomy there it is also helpful in reducing the iop further but you will have more complications and you may have more interventions like a bleb needling and so on what about ocular hypotensives in ocular hypotensives the iop can reduce to 4.1 mm of mercury before and after surgery if you do a lens extraction with a drop in iop of 16.5% and the iop remained lower up to more than 36 months so it's it's still holding good for ocular hypotensives as well what about ntg in ntg the post operative iop reduced and the diurnal iop fluctuations variations also reduced so that was the conclusion in ntg when you have lens extraction so what about the effect on uh, visual fields in visual fields after lens extraction mean deviation improves pattern standard deviation there is no change visual field index no change glaucoma progression index improves the issue is posterior polar cataract is a culprit here where the changes in mean deviation can really occur whereas if it's a nuclear cataract the parameters are generally less affected what is the effect of lens extraction on a retinal nerve fiber layer again after extraction the ganglion cell layer complex thicken thickness increases the rnfl thickness increases especially over the inferior quadrant which is uh, the first area of thinning seen in glaucoma again if there is a posterior polar uh, sub subcapsular cataract likewise it interferes with the rnfl thickness what happens to a phacolytic glaucoma because lens has a role here because it's actually the leakage of protein through the grossly intact capsule we just treat the patient by cataract extraction my my suggestion is don't to go for a combined surgery because the chances of hypotony is more so this is just a, a small snippet of one of my phaco uh, lytic uh, uh, glaucoma patient so you just you can choose whichever is your preference surgery of choice i say cs or if you think you can go ahead and do a your skills are honed in such a way you can go for a phaco you can do that this is one of my cases where i just performed an sacs phaco morphic glaucoma a large lens itself as you can see in this uh, scan can sometimes physically close the angle with its volume causing a pupillary block and again here also the treatment is cataract extraction so the thing here it is a, it's a quite challenging challenging situations because the pupil will be very sluggish you may need to put in some iris hooks again uh, this was one of my patients where we went ahead uh, the uh, capsule was very fibrous but we did a re good rexis and we were able to do a phaco emulsification and place the lens in this patient lens particle induced glaucoma sometimes a cortical material itself closes the angle and you just need to remove the offending material phaco antigenic glaucoma 
So these are some rare uh, uh, lens-induced glaucomas where it occurs due to a broken lens capsule which causes granulomatous inflammation and other conditions such as which shift the anterior lens plane forward are nanophthalmus, microphthalmia, ROP, spirophagia, axial anterior ectopia lentis. In nanophthalmus you can see this is the left hand side is the nanophthalmic eye and the right hand side is the normal eye. So this one is once you remove the cataract the chamber will deepen, angle will widen and it will halt the progression. Retinopathy of prematurity, this is a figure of stage 5 ROP. You can see the stage 5 ROP and the figure here down showing the van Eriks as to how close the iris is with the uh, uh, cornea. So pupillary block itself can be treated with lensectomy but you have to treat the retinal pathology as well. Phacic lens subluxation can cause pupillary block glaucoma, rarely phacolytic too. Treatment, lens extraction. Spirophagia again, this is one of my patients where the round lens, uh, sometimes a pupillary block or sometimes uh, it can just get uh, displaced into the anterior chamber and mostly the catch here is pupillary block with high myopia. Think of this rule out wheel Marchesini syndrome. And this is again another real time scenario where uh, we may be having patients who are on therapy and uh, we'll be taking them for surgery. So this is one of my surgical patients here where uh, I'll just forward the video. So what we need to keep in mind here is during the time of surgery there is always a chance that we, we may end up with PCRN2. PCR2 has a role because we don't want the glaucoma person patients to have a PC rent. So if that is the case I, I dilute my tricot and make sure that we don't have any uh, I dilute it one by third because I keep in mind the steroid response phenomenon that can actually happen uh, because we don't want the patient to have a steroid induced intraocular pressure rise and this is one of my complications where we had a PC rent for a combined phagotrabeculectomy. So always complication management on the table also matters because everything in a glaucoma patient it's all meticulous and it does make a role. So posterior capsule also is part of the lens and in the case of a rent, a well managed rent is very very vital for a successful surgery and not only that for a successful post operative period because we don't want anything uh, to go uh, uncontrolled because of the complication that we have on the table. So managing the complications on the table also matters and this was one of the posterior capsular rents of mine and make sure you don't leave, leave any fragments. So after the rent, this was the rent area, we did a vitrectomy and made sure everything was done and uh, the lens was actually placed in the bag. So this is a, this is a rent here, it was a smaller rent and we were able to do it and the anti-lens capsule also was extended after the surgery so that uh, we don't have any capsular phimosis because we don't want the patient to land up with a capsular phimosis in the post-operative period. So keep in mind that, uh, so this is a nine month review of the same patient uh, who the phaco trap was done. Always evaluate the patient's bleb also. We do the sheen flug imaging or the ASOCT and now the patient is holding on well because on the table management also makes a role. And uh, this is the anterior picture showing the area where the PC rent actually happened. And this is the figure showing that it was more of a controlled posterior capsular excess kind of a rent where which was well managed and the patient is holding on well. So surgical challenges in glaucoma are unique because of its unique anatomy and sometimes if the patient is advanced they can go into a wipeout phenomenon and low endothelial count as to kept, to my, kept in mind because when we handle a combined surgery endothelium can always be weak in these advanced cases. The key points is cataract and glaucoma frequently coexist. Modern phagoemulsification alone effectively lowers the IOP. I always prefer combined surgery when there is a glaucoma with cataract component. Though we have seen that lens as a role, I personally never contemplate clear lens extraction. If it's only cataract, please do contemplate that. And that is where uh, we go ahead. And I once again like to thank uh, Tamonash for giving me this opportunity to have this wonderful topic on lens as a role in glaucoma management. Thank you. We'll take uh, questions at the end. Now we'll have uh, Aditi. She's a cornea uh, expert and she's going to talk on how cornea cries or the aftermath of a glaucoma surgery and its effect on cornea. Thank you very much, Prasanna. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tamanash Basu for making us a part of this IC. So I'm Dr. Aiti Ghosasidhar. I'm a cornea and ocular surface surgeon. And after so much of glaucoma in details, I'll be uh, discussing 
the cornea and ocular surface complication, the cases that we get the reference. Sorry for the technical glitch. So when cornea cries, uh, we are so much engrossed in our own uh, speciality that we sometimes, sometimes unknowingly tend to neglect the complications of other specialities. We are always thinking about what all complication our surgery is going to cause. But then in that case, we sometimes, you know, uh, there's a delay in detecting other complications as well. So here I'll discuss few of the corneal and ocular surface complications. So what all complications can we have? They can be corneal decompensation in form of DMD, endothelial decompensation, or ocular surface damage uh, involving the conjunctiva or the sclera or associated with sclera. So let's have a look at this video. This is a video of a case of DMD uh, referred during that uh, we were present in the OT only. So this is after combined phaco trap when the sur so glaucoma surgeon noticed a superior DMD. So here we can see. So as it was a fresh on table uh, case, I have used only ear and a full fill. The fresher the DM detachment is, we get very good results just with a full ear fill as well. You can see the glaucoma surgeon has already done the PI. So the earlier the detection, the earlier the referral, better the results. What about glaucoma wall related complications? So in AGV, it can be due to tube or the scleral patch trap. Uh, it, uh, so when the tube causes corneal decompensation, how does it cause? It touches the endothelium. It can make a retroconeal membrane by a series of you know, trauma to the endothelium and thus decompensation. So sometimes we have to look towards the positioning. We have to see whether it is moving anterior, whether it is fixed properly. So it has to be a combined approach by the glaucoma person and the cornea person. So how does it happen? It can be when the tube migrates anteriorly. Uh, it can be due to a retrocorneal membrane. There can be a re tube retraction and AGV exposure due to an ectatic graft in cases of combined PK glaucoma. So here we can see an exposed case where we can see there is scleral melt as well. So as the previous speakers were uh, stressing on the use of MMC, we do see a lot of cases with post-MMC uh, used scleral melt or scleral patch graft melt. So these cases as well have to be referred very early. So what are the challenges? We have to assess the endothelial damage, what is the extent, whether it is salvageable or not, whether there's an additional uh, layer involvement, any scarring, whether surgical replacement is possible or not because these patients are already in stage glaucoma and then you have to plan whether you have to go for a DSEC or a PK in such cases. So these are very challenging cases and whether we can uh, treat and conserve the eye with medical management itself. So here's a video. of a case of post-traumatic glaucoma. The patient has an AGV, but here we can see there's a scleral uh, melt, probably after use of MMC. So here we are trying to see whether we can cover that area. The thinning looks okay. So we are trying to cover it with a tenon pedicle, a vascular pedicle uh, covering the ischemic area. So here we have seen tenon has covered, and now we are dissecting the conjecture, minimal dissection, minimal cautery, for our glaucoma friends for their future procedure. Uh, add on amniotic membrane, excellent uh, results. It is a boon nowadays because of its excellent activities, anti-inflammatory. It acts as a basement membrane for the conjunctiva to slide on and heal the gap. Another case, here we can see the glaucoma surgeon has wonderfully put the graft, but they must have tried to cover it with conjunctiva, but it has retracted. So in such cases, we can use amniotic membrane over the exposed scleral patch graft, and then we can see if there is any remnant conjunctiva or tenons, which we can cover it with. Or a multi-layer amniotic membrane with a very large diameter uh, BCL is very good as well. So here, here's the case. Here we can see the graft is looking good. So we didn't have to replace the graft. We just had to cover it with an amniotic membrane, multi-layer amniotic membrane. 
Fibrin glue is a boon as well. It decreases the surgical time. It makes it very much easier. But I uh, personally like to suture at the limbus, as you said. It is always uh, gives a good night's sleep to the surgeons. So the challenges in these cases are exposure, milk, thinning, conjunctival status, tissue of choice. And what are the post-op complications? They can be a conjunctival flap retraction or amniotic membrane. We have to see what is the status of the scleral patch graft in such cases and whether it is causing any change in the tube position. So it is very good if the glaucoma surgeon is also present because maybe I'll be too engrossed in you know positioning my amniotic uh, membrane or graft and ignoring the actual tube position. So here's another case. This is post trap case. Uh, it's a thin cystic uh, blip. It was referred to as with the BCL. And here there was a leak. So here the plan was to use a scleral patch graft. Here we are seeing. We have thinned out the scleral patch graft and with a lamellar dissection, a uh, little bit oversizing, putting a vibrant glue, uh, just flap and put sutures at the edges and cover it with a layer of amniotic membrane and tenon pedicle. Always try to put a vascular pedicle uh, on your grafts. So that this is the case and they give very good results. So again, the challenges are same only, uh, thinning, melt, con the conjunctiva, chances of perforation if the sclera is very thin. So the suturing technique has to be very skilled and refined. And ocular surface integrity, even after we are done with the case, that is not the end. We have to check whether the surface is taking up, whether the graft is taking up or not. So a very simple procedure is you can just stain and see whether conjunctival epithelization has taken place or not. Not only does it detect corneal uh, defect, also it helps in conjunctival defect assessment as well. So here we can see it is well conjunctivalized. There is no retraction. Here we can see early stages of retraction. This area is not epithelized. And here we can see the conjunctival graft has retracted. The scleral melt has starting to set. So to conclude, multidisciplinary approach is the key. Early detection, early referral, and early management is the key. These are the references. I would like to thank my colleagues and seniors for, from my institutions, Dr. Kumar Saurav, our retina surgeon, Dr. Tamnash Basu, Dr. Surajit Sen, because uh, combined approach is always uh, favorable for us and the patient. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prasanna. Thank you, Aditi, uh, for this wonderful talk. So this, this IC, we wanted to cover on how uh, glaucoma surgery has an aftermath over cornea, retina, and uh, the highs and lows of IOP along with lens. To summarize this IC, uh, from a lens point of view and from a cornea point of view, I think uh, every part of the eye matters. For a glaucoma person, as Aditi was rightly pointing out, for a glaucoma friends, she wanted to make sure they get the conjunctiva as uh, much as possible and uh, everything has a role. And that's why we add an amalgamation of glaucoma person, retina, cornea, so that we get to know the different perspectives. And uh, we also brought in how uh, the lens has a role, how the retina has a role. And uh, to just add on to one point, we'll just summarize it for the next few minutes. The lens itself, how it deepens the anterior chamber after lens extraction, has its own way of reduction, reducing the IOP in an angle closure disease, more compared to an open angle disease. And... Uh, that is what was about lens. I would like to uh, tell uh, Dr. Saurabh and Dr. Aditi also to summarize the IC for the benefit of our attendees. So each minute each and we can summarize it and we can close our IC. Yeah, thank you. The retinal complications are mostly because of two things. One is a change in the IOP. The IOP, if the IOP becomes very high or the IOP becomes very low. If the, if the IOP is very low, then it's detachment of the choroid and, and hemorrhagic choroid detachment which can be debilitating. In cases of high IOP, again it is because of the hemorrhagic choroid attachment uh, and um, that that's what causes high IOP. Other thing is the ma maculopathy which can be transient and if it is transient, it, fa it, it again it is because of the hypotony and it improves with time. But if it is long lasting, then it can it can lead to some kind some kind of decrease in vision which is permanent. And most of it is the bleb related endophthalmitis. That is a real emergency because it's it's much more aggressive than a cataract endophthalmitis because of the earlier involvement of the sclera. So bleb related endophthalmitis and even a blebitis is an acute emergency and needs immediate intravitreal antibiotics and with or without vitrectomy for the management. Thank you. 
the a few points on uh, your IC as well. We just add yours. Yeah, but, I uh, think I've yeah. already summarized. Yeah. It mostly it is corneal endothelial decompensation and the ocular surface integrity. So we have to keep these two main things in mind. And whenever you are referring to the cornea person, you can give your pointers as well, whether where you are planning the next, what is your next plan of action? You want to go ahead with a trap, what will be the position, what will be, or you are planning an AGV. So that gives us an idea also to plan how much of tissue we can use for ourselves or we have to use adjuncts in those cases. Yeah. Thank you. If you have any questions, we can have a few comments from uh, Shweta and we'll take some questions. See, as I said, uh, doing a trabeculectomy is only half of the job done. It's ma mainly the post-operative care that you should have. And during the surgery also, it is very important that you handle it very gently. So that you hold, hold the way you hold the conjunctiva, once you do the conjunctival dissection, you hold it at one position and do the whole dissection. Don't go and hold a different position so that you get a button holding, you get a perforation. Once you do, you are taking the flap, if you're not gentle, the flap can tear off. So it's all about how you do the surgery. The surgeon will definitely know what you're going to anticipate in the post-operative period and never close the uh, surgery without being absolutely sure that you, you need the tightness, whatever the uh, scleral flap tightening that you have. Uh, if you are in doubt, do, don't worry. You have to just open it there and uh, tighten it again. Better than taking the patient second time for the surgery the one surgery, what you do, if you do it clean, then you won't be having much of a post-operative problem. So always anticipate and uh, uh, that's what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shweta and thank you, everybody. Do you have any questions? Right. For the interest of time and uh, we'll end it on time, 8.56, we'll give it uh, four minutes before to them. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. We had a wonderful IC. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.